Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the May 15th edition of Local Government Lunch and Learn webinar, co-sponsored by IPA and the City Management Association of Delaware. My name is Troy Mix. I'm Associate Director of the University of Delaware's Institute for Public Administration. Today's topic is economic recovery. And remind you, as we're going through the presentation today, please feel free to submit your questions using chat and the Q&A function as the presentation is going on. Our guest speaker for today served as mayor of the city of Milford and currently serves as member of the Delaware House of Representatives from the 36th District. <clears throat> Welcome to Representative Brian Shoup. Uh, thank you for joining us today and you can take it away. Hello, can you guys hear me? We hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> How are you all? Uh, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. As you know, we have been uh, in the, the, the process of uh, this health recovery, but also this economic recovery for um, over two months now. And uh, we had some news over the weekend uh, that we are going to see our beaches reopening and some of our community pools and I think that is some good news, but also, uh, as many of you know, we need to be cautious and understand that at the forefront that uh, as local leaders and as leaders of the state that we need to also remain focused on our uh, health crisis, which is, which is first and foremost at hand as well. Uh, I wanted to quickly just go through some very quick uh, background of who, who I am. Uh, I think at the heart of who I am is I'm an, an entrepreneur. Um, uh, I am obviously a state representative and I'm a father of two. Um, that's why I'm a little bit late today. My wife and I own two small businesses and we are um, doing uh, split duty. So I, I get to work until noon and, uh, and then she gets to go in because obviously uh, work is a little bit different nowadays, working from home and, and trying to uh, traverse this, as they say, new normal. So I was born in uh, Milford, Delaware. Uh, uh, just in, in you know, south in Sussex County. I am a graduate of the University of Delaware. As I said before, my wife and I own two small businesses, Milford Live, which is a local uh, digital news platform for our hometown, and also Fur Baby Pet Resort, which is a, um, is a pet boutique, doggy daycare, and overnight facility. I was the mayor of Milford for two terms, and also now I am a Delaware State Representative. Um, some more background on me, if you would move forward uh, with the next slide. I'm Milford Live, just quickly, as it was created in 2010, really was a model for, uh, I felt, as a way to push our, our town forward and to create a platform for us to see some... Um, uh, some local news uh, that was uh, highlighted in a positive way instead of always a police and fire report uh, on the front page and uh, really discovered a need in our community to make sure that our positive things were uh, being broadcast out there to our community. The next page talks about our, our business Fur Baby Boutique. Uh, was a, uh, it's created nine years ago by my wife. It's a small brick and mortar business. Uh, which we are kind of traversing. I hate to keep using this word. I know people are tired of it, but traversing the new normal now uh, through our brick and mortar. Uh, we have doggy daycare, hotel, spa, and grocery, and uh, learning to compete in the new marketplace. The next slide shows, uh, as the mayor of Milford, I was uh, fortunate enough to be in a time of expansion where we worked with our partners at Bay Health to uh, create and prepare for the Bay Health Sussex campus in the city of Milford. We also built our executive team from the uh, bottom up from our city manager and our police team. We had a focus on economic development, our downtown revitalization, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a bit with our downtown development district and did a lot of infrastructure planning as well, which I think we'll, we'll get into uh, as well. Right now, uh, I am a Delaware representative. You'll see by the next slide, I am focused on making sure that uh, uh, we are focused on our workforce development, creating, um, uh, making sure we have a pipeline for our vocational workforce that we're not only focused on uh, universities and colleges, but also individuals who are 
want to make a living in our, our workforce that uh, that have other degrees as well, infrastructure and, and financial resiliency. Uh, I am on the committees for education, health and human development and natural resources, uh, to name a few. So if you go to the next slide, what we're really here uh, today is to talk about our economic recovery and what we can do looking forward. Um, it has been, you know, it has been a year of, of for business owners uh, and a small business owner as my, of my, myself, it has really been an unusual year, I think, because of uh, the unpredictability. As a business owner, I can tell you that the one thing that we continue to lean on in our business is predictability. That's why we have business plans when we start. That's why we have uh, balance sheets and why we have cash flow. Uh, sheets that we look at continuously because we want predictability. We want to know what's coming in the door, how much we're spending, where we should be going, looking at those projections and seeing where we should push our business or, or pull back our business. And with COVID-19, like any uh, crisis, the predictability is not there. <laughs> we are seeing that um, it's not there in a, in a lot of aspects, not only in the income coming in, but also the predictability of how um, our, our local and state governments are, are reacting to this because it is an unprecedented uh, situation. Also, the predictability of how consumers are going to react even when the economy is opening. Uh, so it is, it is a bit of uh, an unusual space, I would say, for small business to be. Um, looking at that, though, we I think we can do one thing as municipalities, as state governments, as community leaders in supporting our small businesses, and that is making sure that we listen to our small business community. Um, one thing that we have done here in the city of Milford is we sent out economic recovery surveys to make sure that we understood exactly how people are, are feeling in this time of, of crisis. Um, we, we sent out three different surveys. One was for consumers, one was for business owners, and one was for the actual workforce, asking them questions about how are they feeling, or do they have uh, testing available to them for COVID-19, do they have PPE, uh, uh, personal protection equipment available to them, uh, do they feel comfortable going into stores even when restrictions are opening? Do they Are there things that stores, local small businesses can do to ensure uh, safety? Are, consumers, are there things that consumers would like to see above and beyond restrictions uh, that would make them feel comfortable enough to start giving back to the local economy? So I think with, with almost anything in, in public policy, um, you see a lot of it is understanding what the public's uh, sentiments are, what are their feelings, and putting out surveys online or putting out uh, surveys through Zoom or, or getting that, that feeling of the public of what they need and what they're understanding, what their feelings are really is step number one. And that's something that we've done through the city of Milford and through our office, through uh, the Delaware state representatives as well. And those economic recovery surveys have really served us well to understand where we move forward. Um, talking with our small businesses, one of the things that we have really understood is one of the things that, or one of the components that they lack is the actual PPE um, to open up. And maybe they have enough for their staff now if they're essential businesses. Um, if they're non-essential businesses, maybe they have a difficult time acquiring um, masks or hand sanitizers or um, um, hand wipes for their, their individuals who work there or may be coming in. So what we decided through Downtown Milford Incorporated, which is a Main Street program in Downtown Milford, is to start making open for business kits. Um, there will be kits that have uh, masks in them. They will have hand sanitizers. They will have signage that say uh, that have the guidelines from the state of Delaware and from the CDC necessary for staff, necessary for consumers to participate, to come into businesses. 
and allowing consumers to know that these businesses that have these kits are ready to go, that they are places that are safe uh, to come into and allowing our uh, businesses to, to be prepared on day one. We know that uh, we don't have an economy yet that is open all of the all the way for people to participate and come into all of our businesses but we're working on these open for business kits now so that on day one all of our businesses in Milford can be ready um, these open for business kits are a great collaboration between the city of Milford uh, we have reached out to partners including the University of Delaware um, that will be donating uh, mass to our downtown area uh, actually Evan Park who worked for um, for the uh, city of Milford and for the city of Rehoboth, I believe, uh, contacted me and the University of Delaware will be donating masks to these uh, open for business kits. So it is a great way to collaborate. Uh, we also have First State Manufacturing, which is man they are manufacturing masks for federal contracts and they are located in Milford. They will be uh, pr producing for these kits as well. So it's a great way to collaborate with your business community and with your local governments to create a kit that helps your businesses open up and be safe, also allows your consumers uh, to feel like they are being taken care of. Um, another thing that we've done in the city of Milford is talk about price sharing and supply chain. As many of us know, uh, the PPEs have been very difficult to get more than, you know, just a couple at a time. So we've been working with the state government and with our, um, and with our, some of our partners to make sure that we have a supply chain that our local businesses can actually go to these larger businesses, these larger manufacturing plants or larger governments and purchase through them. Um, not only will they now be able to purchase because they're going through a larger uh, individual or a larger entity, but they will be able to purchase for much less than they would before. Um, one of the neat things about this, the price sharing and supply chain, is that we hope to use this in the future as well. It's not only good during time, uh, times of crisis, but can be used in the uh, future to uh, reduce costs. So some of these things that we're learning that are very helpful in times of crisis will be able to be used in, in you know, normal times as well so we can help our businesses in our downtowns or our businesses in our towns uh, reduce costs overall as well. Um, the fourth thing when we talk about small business support is marketing campaigns. Our towns and our, our, our downtown um, committees pushing out there that our uh, businesses are open and they're ready to go, what dates they will be open once we get more information from the state level of who is open, when they are, and what the guidelines are, making sure that information is readily available and making sure that information is out there to as many people as possible. Uh, we've also approached local um, newspapers, local radio stations, local TV stations, and asked for uh, marketing campaigns. So Downtown Milford Incorporated already does advertising with uh, radio stations and local newspapers and local online media sites, and they've actually leveraged those campaigns uh, to use them now for their local businesses to talk about them being opening, to have uh, display ads and videos, on these radio sites, on these television sites, on these uh, online newspapers, and to use those marketing campaigns instead of just talking about their organization, to talk about all of these small businesses within, uh, within this geographical region as well. So it's really been a campaign where our, our towns and our uh, small business, or our towns and our downtown marketing um, uh, corporations really have been able to refocus who they are and instead of focusing solely on them have looked to the broader uh, community and really have focused on uh, our businesses as well if you guys were good in the next slide I'd be more than happy to um, so when we talk about um, our towns we also want to talk about future planning as well one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about today um, was something that I have seen has been very effective with businesses, and that is what they call the click and mortar grants. 
Um, it, we all see the uh, the traditional brick and mortar is what we know, the traditional downtowns. Excuse me a second. Uh, so the, the traditional uh, brick and mortar is what we hear about our downtown areas. And uh, what we knew, know is that also we need online businesses uh, to, to help as well. So what we've done at Fur Baby Boutique is we have wanted to get an online store for a number of years, um, but we really haven't set the time apart to be able to do that. And what this has really allowed us to do, this crisis of COVID-19, has really uh, made us speed up our process of getting a, a online store for Fur Baby Boutique. And I think it's something um, that is very important for a lot of small businesses uh, that, that maybe they have not considered before. It's something that we have been planning for over five years. And since we have implemented it in the last seven weeks, we have seen thousands of dollars come in uh, from our small business alone just from online sales. It's something that has helped us stay afloat during the COVID-19 crisis as we've had to, um, as we've had to, you know, kind of turn our business model upside down. But it's something also I think that moving forward that more businesses, especially small businesses, need to take a look at to compete in this, uh, you know, in the new digital age. And I think it's something that we can help with either at a state level, the Delaware Division of Small Business, or maybe nonprofits and downtown businesses or downtown um, organizations can help with giving grants for click and mortar uh, operations. Um, it's usually a couple thousand dollars for a uh, for a business to go online, but it's something that will be invested in their future. So if there's a way that we could come together as uh, uh, public administrators uh, and create a grant system that maybe would be a, a half match for for local businesses that would strengthen them for the future, I think would be a good investment on, in our local businesses. Um, also just, uh, something as simple as signage for our, our business districts. I know it's something that seems simple, but it's, it's something that some, that we forget. Um, as you see on the right side of your screen, there's also ways to make that very unique. Uh, we had an overpass at route 14 that goes into our downtown district. And we made sure that we put signage on it that says Milford, Delaware, so that people know that they are, um, they are coming past some somewhere that that's something different that there's a there's a town there instead of coming by 80 90 miles per hour and not knowing that there's anything there um hopefully now they will see that they will see the branding they will see the stonework and they'll they'll, they'll go on their little personal computer their phone on, in their pocket and say hey what is milford delaware we want to see more about that we want to learn more about that town so i think more signage of our business districts really can help with that future planning as we go past this COVID-19 crisis, making sure that our smaller towns uh, really are focused on, um, focused on making sure that our business community is, is healthy and that um, people are really engaged of where it is. We've had so many people ask us over the years, we'd love to support downtown Milford, but we don't know where it is. Um, so we decided that we would uh, make sure they, they had no, uh, no excuse and put a huge overpass uh, with a sign that said Milford, Delaware, right in the middle of the, uh, the, the uh, road that has the most traffic in, in the state of Delaware on Route 1. So, you know, coming up with unique ways of how to use uh, your roadways and, and getting people into your business districts, I think will, will help our businesses in the future as well. Um, I wanted to mention, I'm sure there's individuals on here that have either work in towns or have been to towns with the DDD rehabilitation, that's the downtown development districts. If your town is not a part of that, I would urge you to, um, to look into becoming a downtown development district community. The town of Milford has been one since 2018 now. And we have seen an amazing impact in our downtown area. What this does is it encourages private investment in your downtown area by leveraging state grants. For, um, for every private investment that's put into rehabilitation of, um, 
uh, commercial or residential properties or new construction, the state will give up to 20% grants um, for those projects in a given downtown development district. Ours is 170 acres and we have had uh, tens of millions of dollars of private investment pumped into our uh, downtown area through this downtown development district project. Uh, it is, is incredible. We've had um, all the way from new buildings. Uh, we have a new, ta new townhouses that are being uh, uh, constructed on the corner of our downtown right by the gateway. We have a new commercial um, hub that will be on the other side of the gateway on Front Street. And we have old businesses, uh, excuse me, uh, former businesses that are deteriorating that are um, now coming down as well. It really gives an opportunity for your downtown to come to life through private investment uh, with a 20% grant opportunity um, uh, from the state of Delaware. Another thing as well is, is looking just at business district roads, facades, and sidewalk repairs. And I know this is all future planning, but I think through the COVID-19 process, as we have all kind of been more at home than away, um, I know in the city of Milford, we've been really focused inside of our town and looking at ways that we can improve where the businesses are. And maybe some of the things that as administrators or as, you know, um, as city managers or, or looking as community leaders that maybe we've forgotten inside of our hometown that, that areas that we pass every day or, you know, it's something as simple as a, a range of sidewalks that we've passed, you know, for the past 20 years that we don't pay attention to anymore that lead right into our business district that maybe something that simple uh, of that and some landscaping really could bring people into the downtown area. And I think that's going to become more and more important as people seek out uh, over the summer and into this fall of creating ways to get back into their own town to support more local businesses after this COVID-19 crisis of making our towns more welcoming and making uh, that consumer confidence there. So if you will go to the last um, slide, I wanted to talk about some state legislation that, that I've been working on as well. Um, one of the things that um, as a small business owner that I have seen um, obviously is, is the, is the unemployment. Um, we have over 85,000 individuals that are on, uh, unemployment in the state of Delaware. Um, I don't think that a lot, a lot of people understand that we also have over 55% of our workforce in the state of Delaware, uh, come from small businesses. So there are a lot of individuals who work for these small businesses that are on our unemployment rolls now uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis and the restrictions that have been put on place by, uh, on, on small businesses. The unemployment taxes that small businesses pay um, is kind of like, uh, I, would, I would say it's kind of like car insurance. So the more individuals you have in a business that go on unemployment, the higher your unemployment tax comes every year. Obviously, this is an unusual year uh, with individuals going on unemployment. From my perspective as a small business owner, we had 15 individuals that we employed at Fur Baby Pet Resort in January, and now we have five. And uh, you know, to decrease by two thirds, um, just kind of overnight, uh, was devastating to our employees and their families, obviously, was devastating to our business, was devastating to our um, customers, and is going to be in the future, um, as we come to the year's end, devastating on our, our tax rolls as well, uh, trying to pay for unemployment taxes for, for 10 individuals. Um, for a business, one of the um, most important things that we can do as a small business owner is make sure that we have a healthy business so we can carry on. Uh, we intend to hire uh, all, all of our other 10 employees back and, and more on top of that. Um, but unemployment taxes that, were, uh, that have been created because of this COVID-19 crisis are, are going to make that for a lot of businesses, including our own, almost impossible to do that. Um, so we want to make sure that we are giving our small businesses a fair chance 
to get back up to where they need to be and for them to be able to have an opportunity to hire more people back uh, in this economy where we're seeing you know, 85,000 plus individuals that are on unemployment. Um, some other proposed legislation is the PPP tax forgiveness. There has been talk on the federal level. Um, originally, um, there was, you had to spend 75% on payroll uh, for the tax forgiveness, but a lot of that money was based on taking that, uh, taking that tax, or excuse me, taking those grants and putting them, um, mainly giving them to people even if they weren't working. So some of that PPP tax forgiveness has been talking about uh, lessening those and making the payroll a little bit less, maybe a 60-40 split or something of that nature. Another proposed legislation, more built for the future, but I think is very, very important is broadband access, especially here in Sussex County. Um, it is really hard for small businesses to compete, uh, especially in Western Sussex, when they don't have broadband access. Another thing is also for, for the workforce. If they don't have broadband access, um, it is very difficult then for them to seek out employment, for them to get their resume and, and references to an employer, to um, get information for, you know, to find maybe to leave that job and to find a better job. So broadband access is something that we need across the state of Delaware to help um, our towns and to help our, our small businesses. And then the last thing before we get into questions I'll talk about is the, is the budget smoothing process. It's something that we've needed for a while. I will, um, I will give a, um, a just a, a thank you to uh, Governor Carney for starting the budget smoothing process. This was something that was of high priority when um, uh, Ken Simpler was in our state treasurer, and I think our current state treasurer is working on, on continuing budget smoothing as well. But it basically states that, the budget smoothing process basically states that our state government should not grow any more than our, our private economy is growing. So if, and, and I suggest that we use this with, with towns as well. We, we did this in a, in a sense with the city of Milford when I was the mayor. If our private economy is only growing 3% a year, then our state government should not be growing more than 3%. We should not be growing programs more than 3%. We should not be growing employees more than 3%. We should be staying within that range. Um, there is a, a push uh, and I understand it because I was the executive of, of Milford. There is a push when more money comes in the door to spend that more money. There's always something to spend it on, whether it's more roads or more sidewalks or more infrastructure. But you have to remember that the economy is always going to go down. It's a cyclical economy. And if this crisis has taught us nothing uh, more than it has taught us that there is always an X factor out there as well. Even when we, you know, had an economy almost at its highest, when we were seeing nothing but, uh, uh, you know, smooth sailing and, and clear skies, uh, we, we had something hit us out of the blue. And the budget smoothing makes sure that we put everything above uh, all of that spending above where the economy is growing, and we put it basically in a reserve account. And that way, when the economy goes down, we have money to pay the bills. We have money to make sure that our infrastructure is still growing and that we're not pushing all of that, um, all of that needed revenue onto our citizens uh, in, in the form of uh, raising taxes, in the form of cutting services and, and making reactionary spending choices. So budget smoothing is something that I believe that we need to do even during these hard times, even, even as we're going to see very hard fiscal decisions in the next um, you know, years, couple of years at, at Legislative Hall in Dover, I believe we need budget smoothing process as well because we are going to continue to see a push to, to spend every dollar that's coming in the door and we need to make sure that we're saving uh, because, you know, it may seem like a rainy day now, but there's going to be more and more rainy days that we need to, we need to save for in the future. So I, I know that there was a lot of information on a lot of different topics very quickly, but I was told I had 15 minutes <laughs> to speak. And I think the more importantly, I wanted to hear from your questions and if there's any way that I can address them and help and 
help you all in any way understand uh, from my experience, if I, if I can give any, any assistance. So again, if you have questions, you can use the, the chat or the Q&A. Um, we do have a few slides that Troy's gonna go through and, and if you think of questions after that, you can, you can go ahead and, and put them in the chat then. If you wanna to go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Thank you, Representative Shoup, for that. Um, I'm gonna say ditto to a lot of what uh, Representative Shoup went through. Um, and just get you, motivate you to think a little bit about um, short-term and long-term uh, responses. So we're definitely in the short-term kind of response phase of you know, communicating closures, uh, inventorying impacts, hopefully communicating with your businesses in your community, uh, supporting their reopening with things like the Open for Business Kit that was mentioned, for example. Uh, but thinking through some of your procedures, now's the, now's the time to do that, or you know, hopefully you've already begun to think of some of these procedures, but also thinking about kind of, for lack of a better term, traffic control at and in businesses, and how you can support businesses to uh, make sure it's a safe environment uh, in the store or on the sidewalk, for example, uh, making that a, an outreach to businesses, but also outreach to residents on procedures that kind of make sense. And I'll share some examples on the next slide when we get there. Um, remembering it's not just retail and restaurants that are you know, facing um, safety considerations or thinking about reopening. So reaching out to other employers in your community as part of that, uh, making sure people are prepared for open for business, things like your manufacturers, things like your professional service offices, uh, what uh, safety considerations should they have as, in mind as they uh, reopen or, or continue business depending on their situation? Uh, reconsidering fees that you have and your land use processes, now is the time to think about that, both like to keep business going now and you know, as we face uh, kind of any kind of uh, recession, whatever the length of that might be, uh, it's an opportunity to rethink those and think about how you can get your community restarted uh, most quickly. Uh, but it's all about communication at this point. And then I, I was glad to see the slide on future planning. Uh, thinking about what those shovel-ready projects are in your community right now is going to be important because while we don't know, uh, there may yet be uh, more stimulus support from the federal level that is going to be looking for projects at local communities to invest in. So the more you have uh, ready to go, uh, thought through, uh, through your processes kind of approved uh, by all the relevant parties, that's going to be important for making sure you're in line for funding that may become available. So just go to my final slide. There's a lot of speculation around what long-term recovery will look like, what that new normal is, and how long it'll be in place. Uh, no one really has a crystal ball, I would say. Um, you know, this is a chance, though, I think, to kind of revisit or create your economic development strategy, realizing that a successful economic strategy is not going to be completely new at this point, even if you're creating it for the first time. It's going to be based on assets in your communities, the things that make your communities tick right now, uh, successful businesses that have worked uh, well in your community over time, uh, residential amenities, downtown amenities, those kinds of things are going to be what you want to build on. But the more you dust that off and again have rationale ready for why uh, projects you may want to pursue if and when funding becomes available, uh, Hopefully, all things being equal, you'll be more competitive for that funding. And not everything's going to change, as there's been speculation, but there will be some things that will change or, you know, things that will take time to snap back to uh, normal reality. Uh, some of those things we'll just have to monitor, you know, how, how comfortable are going to people feel, you know, going from total physical distancing to relaxed standards over time, how are preferences going to change. How are, is the demand for office space going to change if people are you know, doing more remote work? And then what does that mean for your community? It's gonna mean different things based on the makeup of your community, the land use and commercial districts, et cetera. But uh, I would say one thing uh, that Representative Shoup talked about are people are gonna be eager to get back into your community. And that's really gonna create more of a premium, I think, on the quality of your place. So the more investments you can make in uh, making your place welcoming for business and residents from an amenity standpoint, from a, you know that key infrastructure that uh, tells you where the business district is and makes it a more attractive place to, to live, work, and shop, 
uh, those are going to be probably long lasting investments, uh, regardless of how uh, permanent those trends are. And when this slide shows uh, sent out, there's a good list of resources from the Economic Development Administration, which is where a lot of the federal funding will come through to support economic recovery and IEDC, the International Economic Development Council on COVID-19 resources. Uh, and I just listed the city of Tampa has a nice website kind of thinking about reopening, just an example to get you thinking about uh, messaging that might work for your community. So thanks for your time. And it looks like there's at least one question in the comment box. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out, um, Emory. So it's from Brett Sadler at Claymont Renaissance. Um, he said, Claymont overbuilt in commercial retail since after World War II. Uh, brick and mortar was struggling prior to COVID-19 or worried the situation will worsen. What thoughts do folks have about uh, potential repurposing of commercial storefronts, for example, becoming residential? Uh, you know, it really depends on, on where it is, but I think that, uh, you know, communities are very open to uh you know, changing, changing from commercial to residential, um, and, and back again, just depending on what it is, what I have really seen in the downtown districts, which is unique is a change, um, to put, um, the storefronts kind of, uh, so instead of commercial, uh, all, or instead of putting all residential, putting the storefronts in kind of the front 800 square feet of a building, and then the back of it uh, would be residential, and then on top of it would be residential as well. So you still have the the, the quaint um, facade of a of a small downtown that you would expect, but a lot of these uh, these stores don't need more than that uh, 800 square foot because their revenue sources are coming from the click and mortar or for coming from other areas. So I think we really have to re think of repurposing these, these storefronts and what it really means. Um, when we opened our, our business for baby boutique, uh, before we got into the services, we only had 800 square feet and we quickly learned that if we only did our services, we weren't going to survive. Um, so then we got into doggy daycare and overnight and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's something that we've seen in downtown areas is that there's more and more residential on top and behind storefronts and the storefronts have actually been shrinking to the front. And in some cases only taking up about 400 square feet in those areas. So I know towns like the city of Milford have been open to, uh, talking about that. Um, you might want to check with the, the town of Claymont because they probably have an ongoing, um, uh, uh, I, I, what is the process called? You guys wouldn't know because the university does it with, <laughs> with towns, uh, their, um, Comprehensive planning. Exactly. <laughs> Master planning. Yeah, yeah they're, they're comprehensive plan. Uh, we did one with uh, the University of Delaware when I was the mayor. So that might be something that Claymont wants to look into where you actually sit down and you go neighborhood by neighborhood and street by street and say, does this still make sense now? That was, this was planned out 50 years ago, in some cases, maybe 100 years ago. Does this make still make sense for how this town is being used now? All right. Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to apologize. My dogs are barking. Um, were there any, any additional questions before we wrap up? So, Oh, we have one. Um, so we have, I'm going to, I apologize if I get the, the name pronounced wrong. Ronnie Baltazar Lopez asks, how do we balance both the need for economic recovery for business, but also managing the infection rate for lower income and minority communities, especially in Sussex County? Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a great question. I think the number one thing that we need to be uh, concerned about is uh, our health recovery. So at the um, epicenter of this is uh, making sure that our health concerns are, are met. Uh, we have to remember that with our economic recovery, this isn't a forced uh, opening. Nobody is forced to um, go out and participate. If you have a vulnerable commu uh, community, somebody who's 
within that Bernal community, they should still stay home. Uh, I would applaud the governor and his uh, staff for continuing to um, do increased testing sites, especially in, in Milford and Georgetown and Millsboro and these uh, hot spots and continuing to do or starting to do these tracing programs as well. I don't think that we can forget uh, that there needs to be um, a concern for, for the health community, especially in these lower income uh, communities. And that's something that we need to continue to focus on. So when we talk about opening our, reco uh, our economy, we need to be very health conscious. It needs to be um, following the CDC guidelines of wearing a mask, these six feet um, uh, social distancing, using hand sanitizers, and at the same time, to currently, we need to be making sure that as a community, um, we have testing sites available, we have uh, PPE available for individuals, and making sure that we have education available for individuals to make sure that if they have symptoms or if they need resources, that they are available, available for them at the same time. And I would ask Ronnie if there's any uh, suggestions um, that he has um, that please, you know, present it to us or present it to me as a state representative that we could we could help with as well. Um, if there's any demand that we're not meeting in these communities, um, to please, you know, bring it to our attention so that way um, we can put them on the table and we can get them out to these communities as, as quickly as possible. I think that was an excellent question and, and that's part of the reason that we asked Representative Shoup to um, join us today because sometimes it seems to be drilled down to you either you know support the economy or you support the public health and I think that Milford's approach and Representative Shoup's approach is very much about balancing the needs of both and I think um, those are the things that we're going to be working on as we move forward and you know I, I know in Lewis, we're working hard to try to figure out what does the business community need from us? So we're trying to, to maintain that, that constant dialogue because we don't want to give them solutions to the problems that aren't the problems they've identified. So I think um, a lot of this really does come down to collaboration and regular communication. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up? I think one of the other things we need to do for some of uh, our communities that aren't on Facebook or don't have a chance to get on chats like this is finding other venues for education as well. Um, I know in our some of our uh, manufacturing communities and also I, I'm just going to take one for example that's a huge one in Milford is is Purdue. So one of the things that they have done there is a lot of the education has been put into Spanish and Creole because a, a lot of the individuals who work there and their families, uh, that is either their first language or is it, it is a dominant language that they use. Um, there is also, although the physicians at Bay Health are technically their family doctor, a lot of those families do consider the physicians at Bay Health to be either their primary care doctor or they have a trust level that that a lot of other people would have with their primary care doctor. So those individuals within uh, Purdue who are the physicians are talking to people about uh, the severity and also how quickly uh, COVID-19 can be transferred as well. I know the Milford School District uh, has been uh, giving out food at their sites uh, throughout the our district uh, through the Milford School District and giving out information in uh, multiple languages and reaching out also by phone as as well we we also have to we always have to remember I think as administrators and as community leaders just as Ronnie brought up and thank you is that just because we're on Facebook or just because we send out emails doesn't mean that that's how everybody digests information and unfortunately a lot of times those same people who aren't digesting the information in that way maybe aren't getting the information at all so you know that's something when you think about and you go back to your towns how do we reach out it may be something as as 
you know, as, as, as we would think basic as handing out flyers or going into a neighborhood or something that we think of, you know, well, that's, that's old school. Well, that, you know, that's the only school they know. And <laughs> we've got to be aware of that and making sure that they, that information gets there. Okay, I was trying to unmute, I apologize. Thank you very much, Representative Shoup, for joining us and for sharing your perspective and, and experience with us because I do think that this is going to be a challenging time and to the degree that we can work together to, to move things in a, in a healthy direction for both our, our physical health and our economy, the better off we'll all be. So thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. I will be sending out the slides for this week and for last week as well as um, a, a, an evaluation link. So we hope that you will take part in that. And again, thank you all for joining us in these past weeks. And I think it's been very helpful for um, those of us on our side. So we're hoping it's as helpful to you. So thank you. <laughs>